thank you all for coming. I know that there will hopefully will be a few more who straggle in. Um, there's coffee in the back if you haven't had a chance to grab some coffee. Welcome to the second day in our kickoff event for the grant funded by the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, I will during our working lunch I will say a little bit more about this the scope of the grant and they're all focus on f four different dimensions of the grant itself. Today it's a it's a pleasure to introduce to you our second keynote speaker and um, um, I'm going to just give you a brief introduction to, to his work and then I'm going to turn the floor over to him for his talk. So in this session I'm happy to welcome Dr. Jason Baer, Professor of Philosophy at Loyola, Mar Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. It's not in Los Angeles, is it? Is it? Okay, sorry. Uh, Dr. Baer holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Washington, Seattle. His primary areas of specialization are epistemology and virtue theory, especially virtue epistemology. He's published numerous articles and is the author of three books with a fourth under contract from Oxford University Press. He's also directed a grant of over $1 million from the John Templeton Foundation titled The Intellectual Virtues and Education Project. And in connection with that grant, he helped to found the Intellectual Virtues Academy of Long Beach, California, a charter middle school. Uh, so, Dr. Baer, thank you for your willingness to engage in this conversation with us, and I'll turn the podium over to you for a talk titled Intellectual Virtue and Civic Education. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, my first time to Alabama, and therefore to Montgomery as well. Uh, I'm looking forward to coming back. Um, sometime soon. Thank you all for taking the time to be here. Um, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to get to talk to you about some of these things. Um, I'm going to set a timer for myself here. We'll see how that goes. Did everybody get a handout? Okay, we'll, we'll get to those, those, those quotations um, eventually. But I'm going to start by saying just a word about kind of general word about my hopes for the next 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and I'll preface it by sharing a story from the poet um, David White. And in an interview, there's a, you may be familiar with a public radio program called On Being, which is hosted by Krista Tippett. She has a wonderful interview with the poet David White. And at one point, he tells the story of having spoken at a um, psychological conference, presumably was reading some of his poetry. And afterwards, he had um, a man come up to him and say something to the effect of, we need to hire you. And White said, for what? And the man said, to bring poetry to corporate America. And David White said, for what? And here's how the man responded. He said, the language we have in that world is not large enough for the territory that we've already entered. And in your work, the language of poetry, the work of poetry, I've just heard the language that's large enough for it. I love this anecdote because it's a case in which um, someone was acquainted with a certain kind of language, and that gave him an opportunity to better understand the world he was already in and the things that he and others were trying to achieve in that world. And so my hope in this talk is to introduce you all to some language that will be somewhat foreign to many of you, but that I hope might allow you to better understand and articulate and thereby to pursue some of the things that you're already doing and that you already care about. That it might help you better understand and inhabit um, the world or the territory that you are already in as educators. So, a little bit more specifically, whoops, I'm having to do double duty here. Okay, um, the, a couple of, a pair of aims for, for 
our time together. One, I'd like to introduce you to some language and concepts that illuminate an important but elusive dimension of character and citizenship. To introduce some language and some concepts that illuminate an important but also elusive dimension of character and citizenship. And then secondly, I'd like to underscore the educational significance of this dimension. Well, I'm going to begin by asking you to do a little bit of reflection. Two questions for you. One, when you think about what it is to be smart or intelligent, we're at a university, this is a fair question. When you think about what it is to be smart or intelligent, what qualities or attributes come to mind? Let's just start with that question. I'm going to give you maybe 30 seconds to, to actually sit and think about this. I'm, um, it's not a rhetorical suggestion. I hope you will maybe even jot down. When you think about smarts or intelligence, what qualities or attributes come to your mind? Even just kind of word association. Open-minded. Open Versatility. Versatility. Ability and willingness to learn. Good ideas. I, good ideas. Pause and consider. Yeah. The ability to process information in a shorter amount of time compared to the average person. Ability to laterally think. Okay. To think laterally, yes. I'm realizing that in a way this, this little exercise here is going to backfire because you're a self-selecting audience. <laughs> I should have said, think about what the ordinary person would say to or, or answer, how the ordinary person on the street or, uh, uh, or a colleague who was completely uninterested in coming to a talk like this might have answered the question. It's okay. Um, but I am looking for your kind of, I'm not looking for right answers, I'm looking for your, almost your pre-theoretical um, uh, uh, answers to the question, so good. Um, secondly, when you think about words like character or virtue, what qualities or attributes come to mind? Empathy. Empathy. Honesty. Honesty. Morals, word association, character, virtues, kindness, kindness. Being, a good being a good person. Okay. Good. All right. Well, I'd like to go a little bit deeper with with each of these um, constructs. Let's start with intelligence. I think often we associate intelligence or smarts with the possession of knowledge. We think of people who are smart often as people who know a lot about a lot. Or sometimes we associate intelligence with a kind of natural intellectual ability or aptitude kind of intellectual giftedness. Sometimes we associate intelligence with certain skills, like critical thinking skills or problem solving skills. Intelligent people are skilled thinkers in that sense. I think those are fine and, and good answers to the question within limits. To see why, note that, for instance, someone can know a lot about a lot, be intellectually gifted, but also be intellectually arrogant, dogmatic, closed-minded, insensitive. 
And I think we'd say of such a person that they're lacking a dimension or aspect of intelligence or good thinking. But notice that the deficiencies there are personal in that they say something about the person. To say that someone knows a lot about a lot is not necessarily to say anything about the person as a person. If you say, what's so-and-so like? And I tell you, well, they're really knowledgeable. Eh, doesn't really tell you who they are as a person. But if I tell you that they are intellectually arrogant, closed-minded, dogmatic, uh, that tells you something about their thinking, their intelligence, and about who they are as a person. Something similar applies, I think, even to um, the possession of certain thinking skills. I could have very strong critical thinking skills or problem-solving skills, but be unmotivated to use them or be unmotivated to use them well. As a consequence, I might be intellectually lazy or careless. As such, I'd be limited or deficient as a thinker or in the department of uh, intelligence. It would be a strike against my intelligence if I were intellectually lazy or careless. Conversely, intelligence involves something personal, something volitional, something even we might say characterological, because it says something about my character if I'm intellectually lazy or careless or arrogant or dishonest. So the main thing I want you to see at this point is just that intelligence isn't merely a matter of knowledge or skills. It also has a personal or volitional or characterological dimension. Just flag that point and we'll get back to it. So now let's turn to the question about virtue and character. I asked you to think about what qualities come to mind when you think about the terms or concepts of virtue or character. And some of you mentioned some of these qualities. I think often we think of qualities like kindness or compassion, generosity, integrity. We think of having a good heart. Once again, fine and good as a start for what it is to um, have good character or be virtuous or be a good person. But understood in a certain way, this might miss the importance of good thinking when it comes to being a good person. I might have all the good will and motivation in the world but if I'm not paying attention, or asking the right questions, or thinking critically, I might not be a very good person. So what that illustrates is that good character and being a good person has an intellectual dimension that we can sometimes lose sight of. We need to be appropriately attentive and careful and thorough in our thinking in order to behave uh, and live in a good or virtuous or ethical way. So um, intelligence and good thinking have a kind of personal characterological aspect and then good ethical or moral character has a kind of intellectual or epistemic aspect. And in these respects then, I think um, character overlaps with and intersects with cognition. 
And it's that point of intersection, the intersection of character and cognition, or heart and mind, or intellect and will, that I want to uh, kind of um, do a deeper dive with you about. And given the present context of this grant, given the, uh, our, our location here, I think there's no better source to consult um, than some of the writings of Martin Luther King Jr. And so now I'd ask you to take a look at the, at the handout that you should have. And really, as I've told Aaron, I, I can't improve upon what he, what he says in these quotations. And I would not normally, I don't think I have ever in any talk I've given come close to reading as many quotations uh, or looking with the, the audience at um, the number of quotations that I'd like to just look um, with you at. I'm not going to read all of these, but I might read all of them minus one. We'll see, we'll see how it's feeling. Um, but I want to go carefully with you um, through these quotations. They come from two different essays, both of which are um, compiled in this book that you see the image for there, called, you don't see the image for there, that you see the image for it there, um, called The Strength to Love. So the, the first are, are set of uh, selections come from an essay titled Love and Action. So pay attention to both the, the intellectual language in these quotations and kind of the, the moral or characterological language. He says, sincerity and conscientiousness in themselves are not enough. History has proven that these noble virtues may degenerate into tragic vices. Nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. So what he's saying here is that qualities like sincerity and conscientiousness, which we think of as good moral virtues or qualities, um, can lead to moral tragedy if they are not um, accompanied by good judgment or good thinking. Next, he says, as the chief, and, and these are, these are the, s several of these will be um, comments about the church, unsurprisingly, given, given um, uh, I don't know this to be the case, but some of these may be uh, sermons or even adapted sermons, but I think that, that they have application um, even beyond just um, the church. I hope you'll hear that resonance. As the chief moral guardian of the community, the church must implore men to be good and well-intentioned and must extol the virtues of kind-heartedness and conscientiousness. But somewhere along the way, the church must remind them, must remind men that devoid of intelligence, goodness, and conscientiousness will become brutal forces leading to shameful crucifixions. Never must the church tire of reminding men that they have a moral responsibility to be intelligent. Must we not admit that the church, that the church has often overlooked this moral demand for enlightenment? At times it is talked as though ignorance were a virtue and intelligence a crime. Through its obscurantism, closed-mindedness, and obstinacy to new truth, the church has often unconsciously encouraged its worshipers to look askance upon intelligence. What's interesting about this selection is it um, says a little bit more about what he means by intelligence. Though notice here the, the, the characterization is negative. So, so King is saying in these first couple of passages that what we think of as good moral qualities can actually lead to 
moral tragedy and injustice and corruption, even wickedness, if they aren't accompanied by intelligence or good thinking. And so we should ask, well, what exactly does he mean by intelligence or good thinking? And what we, what we get, at least from this, this second selection, is that intelligence or good thinking is about not having thinking that is obscurantist or closed-minded or obstinate or resistant to new truth. I'm going to skip the next selection. He basically makes a, a similar point, but ties it specifically to the fate of Western civilization and of American democracy in particular. So, so far we're talking about sort of morality and intelligence, but um, unsurprisingly, we could also be talking about um, democracy and civilization. In the fourth selection there, he says, one day we will learn that the heart can never be totally right if the head is totally wrong. Only through the bringing together of head and heart, intelligence and goodness, shall man rise to a fulfillment of his true nature. Neither is this to say that one must be a philosopher or a possessor of extensive academic training before he can achieve a good life. So by a strong head or intelligence, he doesn't mean mere academic training or knowledge or intellectual giftedness. He continues, I know many, I know many people of limited formal training who have amazing intelligence and foresight. The call for intelligence, now here comes the positive characterization. The call for intelligence is a call for open-mindedness, sound judgment, and love for truth. Think about those terms. Open-mindedness, sound judgment, and love for truth. They are intellectual or cognitive, and they are emotional or volitional or affective. It is a call for men to rise above the stagnation of closed-mindedness and the paralysis of gullibility. One does not need to be a profound scholar to be open-minded, nor a keen academician to engage in an assiduous pursuit for truth. So here he's, he's fleshing out in more detail what he means by intelligence, and it does seem, um, um, again, characterological, personal in nature. On then to the second um, essay, which is called A Tough Mind and a Tender Heart. You see the, the dichotomy right there between um, uh, intelligence and um, morality or, or ethics. And what I like about this essay is that it further unpacks what he means by intelligence when he says that morality needs and ethics and civilization and civic virtue need intelligence. And he draws a distinction between tough thinking or tough-mindedness and soft thinking or soft-mindedness. I want to look, look with you at what he says about these. Rarely do we find men who willingly engage in hard, solid thinking. There is an almost universal quest for easy answers and half-baked solutions. Nothing pains some people more than having to think. <laughs> Few people have the toughness of mind to judge critically and to discern the true from the false, the fact from the fiction. Our minds are constantly being invaded by legions of half-truths prejudices, and false facts. One of the great needs of mankind is to be lifted above the morass of false propaganda. 
Notice here that intelligence is being characterized again in rich personal terms. But that go beyond, you might, you might think, for instance, given the earlier characterization that by intelligence he means something like open-mindedness, which might sound like it's not very critical. But for him it's both and. It's about open-mindedness and an intense pursuit of truth and a toughness of mind. And he says, the soft-minded man always fears change. This is what, I mean, all of these quotes could could be, are speaking to us in in 2022. This this one in particular, I feel like, has some really um, painfully relevant language. The soft-minded man always fears change. He feels security in the status quo. And he has an almost morbid fear of the new. For him, the greatest pain is the pain of a new idea. The soft-minded person always wants to freeze the moment and hold life in the gripping yoke of sameness. Our thinking can be characterized by a kind of rigidity that prevents us from being able to appreciate new ideas and new truth. To think intelligently would be to think flexibly, open-mindedly, and critically and always with a commitment to believing what is true and not believing what is false. In in these next couple of selections, the focus shifts back to kind of the, the moral significance and the civic significance of having a, a tough rather than a soft mind. He says, we do not have to look far to detect the dangers of soft-mindedness. So what are the consequences of soft-mindedness? Dictators capitalizing on soft-mindedness have led men to acts of barbarity and terror that are unthinkable in civilized society. Adolf Hitler realized that soft-mindedness was so prevalent among his followers that he said, I use emotion for the many and reserve reason for the few. In Mein Kampf, he asserted, by means of shrewd lies, unremittingly repeated, it is possible to make people believe that heaven is hell and hell heaven. The greater the lie, the more readily will it be believed. Too many politicians in the South recognize the disease of soft-mindedness that engulfs their constituency. With insidious zeal, they make inflammatory statements and disseminate distortions and half-truths that arouse abnormal fears and morbid antipathies within the minds of uneducated and underprivileged whites. Leaving them so confused that they are led to acts of meanness and violence that no normal person commits. Tough-minded thinking isn't important merely for good learning or good education, it is that. It's also critical for a stable society. Finally, there is little hope for us until we become tough-minded enough to break loose from the shackles of prejudice, half-truths, and downright ignorance. I don't know if the term misinformation had been invented yet, but if it had, I suspect it would be included in some of these lists. The shape of the world today does not permit us the luxury of soft-mindedness. A nation or civilization that continues to produce soft-minded men 
women purchases its own spiritual death on an installment plan. I really do think that the best thing for me to do right now might just be to get off the stage and let you sit in silence for the next um, however much time we have left. I feel like that would be a little bit irresponsible, so I'm not going to do that. But like I said before, I can't improve on what he's just said or how he's said it. What I do want to do is continue to refine some of the language that he's appealing to here. And this is where some of my own work and, and, um, and training come in. Um, I'm going to skip. Uh, these bullet points just, just summarize what we've already been, been talking about. I'm going to go ahead and switch to the next slide. Um, I work in an area called virtue epistemology. Epistemology is the philosophical study of knowledge. Virtue epistemology is an approach to the philosophical study of knowledge that focuses on intellectual virtues. In some ways, the field of virtue epistemology goes all the way back to um, some of the ancient Greek philosophers like Aristotle, but in its current contemporary iteration, it's a field that emerged in the late uh, 1980s and early 1990s in the writings of philosophers like uh, Ernest Sosa and, and Linda Zagzebski, who are, who are featured there. And virtue epistemologists think in different ways about what exactly an intellectual virtue is, but according to one of the main kind of um, um, uh, approaches to virtue epistemology, we can think of intellectual virtues as the character attributes of good thinkers and good learners. So think for a minute about someone you know or have encountered. Maybe it's a mentor, maybe it's a student you've had. that exemplifies good thinking and good learning. There are various things that you might admire about that person. It might be certain natural abilities they have. It might be certain skills that they've demonstrated. But it also might be something about who they are as a person and a thinker. Something about the way their self or character manifests in how they think and how they learn. Character, intellectual virtues, again, are the character qualities or character attributes of good thinkers and good learners. Now, if you wonder, how are those related to what we normally think of as virtues? Well, a, a very sort of rough and simplistic way of drawing some distinctions here would be to say that intellectual virtues are the character strengths of good learners or good thinkers. Moral virtues are the character strengths of good neighbors. And civic virtues are the character traits of or character strengths of good citizens. And of course, those, those domains overlap, as we've just been talking about. So that might be a helpful, helpful way to, 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 to think about these things. And, and again, my primary focus or concern here is going to be with intellectual virtues, which are the character traits that, that manifest in and that are required for good thinking and good learning. They, are, they, they have a common motivational basis. They are grounded or rooted in a concern or interest in what we philosophers call epistemic goods. Things like truth or knowledge or understanding or even wisdom. So as one virtue epistemologist has described them, intellectual virtues can be thought of as personal qualities or character attributes that a truth desiring person would want to have. If you cared about accuracy and truth and knowledge and understanding, what kind of person would you want to be? What kind of qualities would you want to have? The answer to that question would be most likely a list of intellectual virtues. Speaking of lists of intellectual virtues, um, here is a... Um, 
you know, I'll, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Sorry, the type is, is very small. Um, uh, as Aaron mentioned in the, in the beginning, um, I help, helped found a um, charter school in Long Beach, California called the Intellectual Virtues Academy. And the, the entire school and educational program it re, is re, it revolves around and was designed around the aim of helping students make meaningful progress in intellectual virtues in the context of, not as a separate program, but in the context of academic teaching and learning. And at the school, we focus on um, nine different intellectual virtues. And I'll just quickly say something very brief about each of them. We, we put them into three groups. This, this, this taxonomy or classification is somewhat arbitrary. There are lots of different ways you could classify these things. This isn't an exhaustive list. There are virtues that are not on this list. These are just the nine that we've decided to focus on. The first set of virtues is about getting the thinking and learning process started and started on the right foot, as it were. So unsurprisingly, curiosity is on that list. And we think of curiosity as a disposition to wonder and ponder and ask why. I'm going to skip to the third virtue. I think these, these, these aren't in, the, in, oh no, yeah, skip to the third virtue. Um, I might be curious, but not have much follow through, right? To follow through with my curiosity, I need to have a strong mind. I need to be able to think for myself. I need to be able to form my own judgments. That's the virtue of autonomy. But if I just depend on my own strengths, I might lose sight of my own in intellectual limitations and might not lean on others in the way that I need to. And so, Curiosity gets the process started. Um, um, uh, um, autonomy is, is, is important to really get it moving. And autonomy needs to be balanced by intellectual humility, which we think of as uh, a willingness to be aware of and to own and to take responsibility for our intellectual lim limitations and mistakes. That's the first three group first group of three virtues. The second group of three virtues consists of virtues that are probably familiar to most, most familiar to most educators. These are virtues that, that most of us were already and, and kind of naturally or by our training tend to teach for. They are virtues that help keep the learning process on the right track and, and headed in the right direction. So one is just attentiveness. And by attentiveness, I don't primarily mean, are you sitting up straight and looking at the teacher? Because those of us who teach know that we have students who can fit that description, but who are kind of checked out mentally. And then we can have students whose body language suggests that they're somewhere else, but then they respond to a question or make a comment in class and you realize, wow, you're really here. You're really engaged. So attentiveness, is a willingness to be personally present in the learning process, to bring your full self in heart and mind to what's being learned or discussed or talked about. It's similar to what um, we sometimes talk about as mindfulness applied to the learning process. Intellectual carefulness is the virtue that allows us to be aware of and to avoid potential mistakes. It also helps us get things just right, to dot our I's and cross our T's. An important virtue. Not the most interesting virtue, but it's important. And one, a virtue that most of us just probably already teach for to some extent. But carefulness needs to be balanced by intellectual thoroughness. And by thoroughness, I mean a disposition to go deeper, to um, try to understand. It seeks explanations. It makes connections between ideas. And I often have um, people say, well, what's the difference between carefulness and thoroughness? 
And I'm sure you've encountered that difference in something like the way that I have, if you've, if you've taught for very long. So I have some students who are very, very good at memorizing. They will memorize definitions and bullet points and premises to arguments, and they can regurgitate that information accurately when called upon to do so. Their thinking is careful in the sense that it technically is right and doesn't make mistakes and is precise. But it doesn't go very deep. And it's not clear to me that they actually understand the concepts or ideas that they're talking about. If I said, explain to me this definition or this bullet point, they probably wouldn't be able to do, to do that. They don't have a good sense of how the concepts are related to other things that we've talked about in the course. And then, of course, we have some students who say, right, I'm imagining a, 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 a really long exam, like pulling the next exam out of the, out of the stack, and it's how many pages is this, right? And the student maybe um, you know, goes really, really deep into the segment, makes interesting connections that they probably weren't even asked to make to begin with, but they're being thorough. Um, but there's a sloppiness, and they, they omit certain important points, right? Or, or confuse one point with another. And I know they understand it, but they aren't being careful in their thinking. So again, just like autonomy and humility kind of balance each, each other out, similarly, carefulness and thoroughness balance each other out and need each other. The last set of three um, virtues um, is sort of different in kind. These are all virtues, each one of which um, is aimed at helping us overcome a familiar obstacle to, to productive learning. So one of those obstacles that King has pointed out nicely for us is a kind of rigidity in our thinking. Or a kind of, there's a fine line between rigid thinking and kind of uh, flab, uh, flab, uh, flabby or flaccid thinking. Um, neither one is adaptable or flexible. So we need open-mindedness to think beyond our own narrow perspective, to consider other points of view. Doesn't mean you have to agree or embrace with every view that you, op you open-mindedly consider, but you're not going to stand a very good chance of developing genuine understanding or forming accurate beliefs if you can't step outside your own point of view and consider alternative perspectives. That's an important part of learning and maturing and growing as a thinker or a learner. So we need open-mindedness. Um, fear is another inhibiting factor when it comes to learning and intellectual growth. We can't grow as thinkers or as learners if we aren't willing to take risks. And intellectual courage just is the virtue that equips us to take risks risks in the context of um, learning and pursuing the truth. Finally, uh, it can be tempting, especially when what we're learning is complex or difficult or demanding, and most things that are really worth learning are complex and demanding and difficult at some level, um, there, there's often a temptation to give up. And so we need to be comfortable with intellectual struggle, and we need to be willing to persevere and persist in the face of intellectual challenges. And tenacity is just a word for that quality of a person by virtue of which um, they are able and willing to do that. So curiosity, humility, autonomy, Attentiveness, carefulness, thoroughness, open-mindedness, courage, tenacity are a further and even more specific and concrete way of fleshing out or describing what King was describing or calling intelligence. And remember the connection he draws between intelligence understood in these ways 
and good ethical living and promoting justice in society and having a stable and healthy democracy. Along those lines, I do want to call attention to um, some connections between some specific virtues and the current kind of social and, and, and political and even technological situation in which we find ourselves um, today. One has to do with the state of uh, uh, public discourse. Um, we all know that the, the quality of public discourse is poor. And, and we know that democracy can't function well if we can't have a healthy public discourse. I want to call attention to, to what is, for me, an especially striking feature of our public discourse today. And this is not, this is not true only of, of, of one political party or the other. It's true on, on either end or all ends of the, of the political spectrum. And that is um, a tendency toward vilification. A tendency toward vilification. To thinking toward thinking of the person who disagrees with us, the ideological other, as wicked or bad or terrible or corrupt or unconscionable. Notice that at its root, vilification involves a certain type of thinking. It's how I think about the other's thinking. And, and when I vilify my, my intellectual opponent, and even that language is interesting, right? When I, when I, when I vilify my intellectual opponent, um, my thinking is always rigid and simplistic. It's probably rooted in fear, and that's important to be aware of. But fear then controls my thinking. And my thinking is simplistic, it isn't nuanced. It's rigid. So imagine if we were to start thinking about our intellectual enemies or opponents in ways that were nuanced. In ways that showed a recognition of our own cognitive fallibility, in ways that are nuanced, in ways that are honest, in ways that are fair. That kind of nuanced, good, careful, open, humble, curious, thorough thinking would, I'd suggest, transform <laughs> public discourse. It's hard, it's uncomfortable. Hence the importance of intellectual courage. But it would do something to undercut the tendency toward vilification, which is toxic. I'm also struck by the connection between intellectual virtues and the many great challenges of navigating the contemporary information landscape. And I want to call attention to a couple of different features um, of this landscape. But first, um, I'll remind us of something that we all know, which again is that in order for democracy to function well, we as citizens need reliable access to credible information about political matters, right? Our democracy can't function well if we don't have reliable access to credible information. One of the striking features of the time in which we live is that um, credible information has never been more um, abundant and easily accessible. The problem is that our information environment is polluted with a lot of misinformation or half-truths. 
And then our technology is so good that it makes identifying credible information from misinformation often very difficult. There was likely a time where you could tell just by looking at a website. I can remember that, like, you're looking at that website, that's not trustworthy information. But now technology is so sophisticated that, that it can be difficult to suss out fact from fiction. And I want to be very clear about something. I do not think that the, the solution to our civic uh, woes is, is entirely intellectual virtues and good thinking. Right? There are structural solutions um, and remedies that are at least as important. But our thinking matters as well. How we approach and how we think in the context of our information envir environment is, is, is critical. So we need to ask good questions. We need to be curious about the sources that we're considering. We need to have a kind of healthy skepticism about information that we come across on the internet or on social media. And again, that's because while information is prolific, our information environment is polluted and it's not easy to discern fact from fiction. So that it's incumbent upon us to, uh, I can say think critically, but, but, but these individual virtues that we talk are sort of a way of fleshing out what that actually means. It's a more nuanced, contextualized way of thinking about what it is to think critically. Another striking feature of our information landscape is the malleability of information. The way that we can, each of us, curate the information that we're exposed to, or the way in which Google or Twitter curates that information for us. And then, of course, the consequence of that is what we sometimes refer to as uh, uh, filter bubbles or epistemic cocoons, echo chambers. Not good for um, democracy, not good for public discourse, not good for democratic participation and deliberation. And so again, there, is a structural, there are structural measures that should be taken to deal with um, some of these issues. But even if those structural measures are taken, um, that doesn't absolve us of agency and responsibility for thinking well and thinking critically and thinking effectively. And so I need to, um, again, be curious about how others are thinking. I need to be open to considering alternative perspectives. I need to be willing to admit the limitations of my own perspective. So I need to practice qualities like curiosity and open-mindedness and intellectual humility. These things aren't hard, these things aren't easy, those things aren't easy to do. They can feel risky. But that's just another of say, way of saying that in addition to curiosity, open-mindedness, and intellectual humility, I also need to try to practice intellectual courage and tenacity. So I hope you see uh, some important connections between um, intellectual virtues and um, what it looks like to be um, a competent and responsible citizen in, um, in the times in which we live. Um, well, I didn't get to see that to advance it. Um, well, especially, again, given the context that we're in, I hope, I hope I, some of you are thinking, well, okay, okay, I, this speaks to me as an educator. I like some of this language. Um, part of what it is to educate um, students is to prepare them to become good citizens. Right? And given the connection between the quality of our intellectual character and the quality of our citizenship, we should be asking as educators, 
what would it look like for me to educate for uh, intellectual virtues and therefore, thereby for good citizenship in my immediate context in the courses I teach or the students that I, that I interact with. Um, educating for intellectual virtues is a way of educating for good citizenship. There are other ways of educating for good citizenship. But one of the key things I hope you'll take away from those of you who, who are in the classroom, one of the key things I hope you'll take away from the talk is that educating for intellectual virtues is a way of educating for good citizenship that applies to every discipline and every subject matter. Because every discipline and every subject matter students are learning. They're acquiring knowledge, they're acquiring understanding. And that's the sort of context in which we can seek to nurture the qualities of a good thinker. And by nurturing these qualities of good thinking, we are better equipping our students to become good citizens. Many of you have heard about character education. I'm not sure what your association with character education is. Certainly that term has a history whereby you might think character education is about trying to just about trying to foster moral virtues, maybe even conservative moral virtues. Um, but what I, what I hope you can see is that educating for intellectual virtues is a way of, of practicing character education that can be deeply integrated into academic teaching and learning. If you ask me as a philosopher to think about integrating a focus on kindness and compassion and generosity into my courses, there are some things I can do and some things that I think I should do. But if you ask me to think about how I can integrate a concern with curiosity or open-mindedness or carefulness or thoroughness or intellectual humility, well, then the possibilities really begin to open up. So educating for intellectual virtues is a way of doing character education that applies just as well to math and science or philosophy as it does to literature or, or civics education or something like that. We can create opportunities for our students to practice these virtues. We can support their development. We can model those virtues for them. Which leads to the final point in question, which is, um, is intellectual character education, as I've just described it, is that even possible? If so, what does it look like, and does it work? Great questions that I won't even be able to begin to address today. But I will point you in the direction of some resources where you can begin to find some answers. Um, and the first thing I'll mention is, um, uh, a research institute at the Harvard Graduate School of Education called Project Zero. They do research on a lot of different um, issues in, 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 and approaches to education, but they have done a, a, a good deal of research in the past on intellectual character and what they describe as thinking dispositions. Folks like um, David Perkins, who you might have heard of, um, Shari Tishman, and especially the work of Ron Richhart. They have, they have gone, they're educational psychologists, they've gone into great depth about sort of the construct of thinking dispositions, which are nearly identical to intellectual virtues, the construct of, of intellectual character, and then they also have written uh, multiple books about what it looks like from a practitioner's point of view um, to educate for for good thinking and good thinking disposition. So I'd recommend any of, of Ron Richhart's books to you, Intellectual Character, Creating Cultures of Thinking, Making Thinking Visible. Um, I published a book a year ago called Deep in Thought, A Practical Guide to Teaching for Intellectual Virtues, which is also aimed at sort of spelling out, this is what intellectual virtues are, here's why they're important, and then, and then the book articulates various principles, postures, and practices that align with trying to help our students make meaningful progress 
in some of these virtues. The last book I'll mention that some of you already have on, on your shelves is a book uh, by Nathan King called The Excellent Mind. This book isn't written for educators per se, but it is written for a general audience. And it's a wonderful, readable, engage, engaging introduction to intellectual virtue and several specific virtues. So he has numerous virtues or numerous chapters each of which is devoted to um, a specific virtue. It's a delight to read. It's very intellectually stimulating. If you want to just know more about intellectual virtues or want to um, um, in, explore the idea with your students, um, I can't recommend Nathan's book enough. Um, that's all I've got, so thank you. Oh.